Thanks for joining C-SPAN's Google Plus Hangout. We have with us today Jamie Harrison, who's the vice chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. He's from Columbia. And we also have Tommy Johnson from Eden Prairie, Minnesota, uh, who's a veteran. Jamie, tell us about what you're most looking forward to this week here in Charlotte. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the, to the speeches from uh, tonight, Michelle Obama, uh, the first lady of the United States. Tomorrow, President Bill Clinton, and then uh, I guess the coup de grace, uh, President Barack Obama on Thursday. Uh, this this is a really exciting time for for Democrats, particularly in this region. Uh, uh, North Carolina is one of the battleground states, and so uh, we in the South Carolina Democratic Party have been sending volunteers uh, to assist our, our brethren here in in, in in the Tar Heel states. So uh, to in, in our efforts to, to hope and pray that uh, President Obama once again carries this state uh, in this year's election. All right, let's hear from Tommy Johnson from Minnesota. Is this your first convention, Tommy? Yes, it is. And what do you want to get out of this experience? I want to get uh, President Obama endorsed for four more years. That's why I'm down here. Um, and it, and it's fun meeting up with fellow Democratic veterans, too. Uh, when I was in the military, I was stationed in Fayetteville at Fort Bragg. This is the first time I've been back to North Carolina since 1979. So it's kind of nice to be back in Carolina. What is the veteran community like uh, here in Charlotte? Are there organized events? How are you networking with other veterans? And, and what are the big issues that the men and women uh, who've served this country are fighting for right now? Well. There was a big meeting yesterday uh, in the morning, and there'll be another one tomorrow. Uh, it's uh, veterans and military families. Uh, President Obama is uh, made a big push. He has made a big push throughout his uh, presidency on veterans. The big issue today, right now, is protecting the, the GI Bill. Uh, and one of the problems that the GI Bill has is the for-profit colleges have been gouging veterans coming out. They're expensive. Uh, they don't give them uh, uh, the skills they need to get the jobs. And then these veterans are saddled with, uh, without skills and with big student loan debt. And that's a big problem. So do you want to hear the president or the first lady who will hear tonight talk about veterans? And, and what kind of a message do you want to hear from them? I want to hear the same message that they've been giving us all along is that they're with us. Uh, and they have been all along. Mrs. Obama has been reaching out to veterans' families and military families uh, throughout uh, her term. So has the president. Uh, one of the big, biggest things that veterans, the veterans that I talk to, are very happy is General Shinseki being named to take over the Veterans Administration. I mean, here's a guy that, that spent his whole career in the Army taking care of troops and getting them ready to put them into harm's way. Now he's taking care of them after they left. It's really a good symbol to have someone like General Shinseki running the Veterans Administration. Jamie Harrison, who do you want to hear from this week? What speeches are you looking forward to? Uh, tonight we'll hear from the First Lady. We'll also hear a keynote from Mayor Julian Castro. What are you watching? Uh, uh, first Lady, I'm definitely looking uh, to see that. Uh, one, it's just the political junkie in me is interested to juxtapose her her speech to that uh, of Ian Romney, uh, I think First Lady Obama has done, Michelle Obama has done an amazing job with this First Lady and really, really energized, uh, uh, energized the, the, the base of the Democratic Party, but Americans, uh, regardless of their political uh, uh, identity, uh, she's gone to school, she's, she's been on military bases, talking with uh, veteran families, She's just been a wonderful, wonderful first lady, and I think she's the the, the new prototype for what a first lady should be. Uh, so I'm interested in that. And Mayor Castro, I've met a few times and been very, very impressed. And I don't think most of the country knows who he is, but they will know after this speech. I think he's going to give a great, great speech. Okay. All right. And what is the experience like uh, so far, Tommy, as a delegate? What kinds of events have you been going to? Uh, have you been getting a chance to meet with people? You were talking about the veteran community, but are you getting to meet with people from around the country? 
Yes, I am. One of the things that Charlotte, uh, the host committee, did was stage uh, welcoming uh, delegation parties in various uh, locations around the city. Ours was at Discovery Place, which is the Science Museum, and it was really cool having a party at the Science Museum. We were with uh, delegates from Texas and Louisiana, uh, South Dakota, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Our bus was late. I, I told them to call up the, the event and tell them uh, don't let those people from Louisiana eat all the food while the Cajuns. <laughs> uh, you know how those Cajuns are. <laughs> they, they love their food from Louisiana. Actually, those people from Louisiana liked it when I told them that joke when I got there. <laughs> Well, Tommy, t tell us also just what the what the, the climate is like in Minnesota in terms of the presidential race and, and what people are talking about. Do you think people are going to be motivated to come out on election day? Is there an enthusiasm gap? There is not an enthusiasm gap. And one of the reasons why is the state Republicans put two very controversial uh, constitutional amendments on the ballot. And one is the voter suppression act. As a veteran, this is a, this is a huge issue for us um, because it says that you have to present a valid uh, state ID when you vote to a, to an election official. Well, if you're stationed in Afghanistan, there's not too many election officials over there. If you go by a strict interpretation of how this goes, you, if you're a veteran or if you're in the military serving in Korea or Germany or Afghanistan, you don't get to vote. Period. That's a very divisive one, and plus they have a, a discriminatory uh, ballot that they want to enshrine in the Constitution that our gay and uh, lesbian brothers and sisters can never have the, the full rights afforded to everybody else. And it, we're hoping that we will be the first state to beat it. Now, I'm not a, a gay, and I'm certainly not a lesbian, but when what you're talking about here is discriminating against people, and I'm behind this, 100% because when you can discriminate against one group of people, how soon till they come for me? And we're all in this together. And I, I, and this is really worrying. Uh, as far as, as the state Republican Party themselves, they're the most scandal plagued Republican Party around. They literally got evicted for non payment of rent this spring. Uh, and it took a last minute deal at the courthouse uh, to have the Republicans office, they're $2 million in debt, they've been hit with record federal election commission fines, and of course they're running on the platform of fiscal responsibility. Well, I'll turn the question to Jamie Harrison. How does the president and his campaign deal with the uh, perceived enthusiasm gap this year? How motivated are uh, friends and family that you have to get out and vote, and do they feel like their vote will matter? Yeah. You know, I, I think going into the, the early part of this campaign, it was the traditional presidential sort of hang of people, uh, you know, just kind of tired of politics. But people are really starting to pay attention and, and listen to what the candidates have to say. Um, a lot of my family members who were very excited and energized in 2008 uh, are starting to, to get that same feeling back now, particularly after watching the, the, the Republican and some of the fallacies that came out of that. So um, I, I, I think uh, the, 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 myth, the, the myth of a huge enthusiasm gap, by the time we get to Election Day, I think that will pretty much uh, be dissipated. I, I think you will see a lot of the people who came out and support uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden in 2008 come back and do the same thing in this election. And, and it means so much more. I think, you know, 2008 was important, uh, but th this is the, the 2012 election is really, really important. There's a lot riding on this for a lot of a lot of Americans. And Jamie, Tommy brought up a voter ID laws and issues surrounding that. What are you watching uh, for your state or the states nearby you, the states that are neighboring you or close by, like Florida? Uh, well, I, I don't have to go to Florida to look at voter ID laws because South Carolina has one of the worst laws that was passed uh, over uh, over a year or so ago. Uh, and right now, uh, just over the past week, 
there was a federal court trying to make a decision on whether or not to strike down for good that uh, our voter ID law. Uh, Governor Haley is very proud in, in her speech at the con Republican convention. Uh, she talked about uh, uh, she talked about the fact that you know you need uh, an ID to buy Sudafed, you need an ID to get on to an airplane. Well, you know, Sudafed and airplanes aren't in the U.S. Constitution. Um, however, the the right to vote uh, is, is referenced, or, or the, that authority that we have, it, and the spirit is there in the Constitution. And I would tell Governor Haley and and the Republicans who are so forthright on, on this issue of voter IDs, when you know for generations people have gone and voted with just using their registration cards. There, there is nothing new right now to uh, to justify it. Our elections commission in South Carolina said that there were no cases of voter fraud in, in which a voter ID would have remedied. Um, and you don't need an ID to go see your member of Congress. Uh, you don't need an ID to see your member in the state house or, or in the state senate. Uh, so then what is the justification then to have this, this type of new identification uh, to, to vote for? Um, so I, I don't know. I, you know that is a fight that is very very personal to me because there are a lot of difficulties that many folks uh, in South Carolina and all across the South have had because of the history of this country. My grandfather, uh, in you know, an old and African American, he since passed away in 2004, but he was born in his house to a midwife, uh, and so he didn't have a birth certificate. And so, uh, but once he got the right to vote, and he didn't have the right to vote his entire life, but once he got the right to vote, he exercised it. And but had he been alive today, he would be. Uh, it would be very, very difficult for him to to get the identification as uh, the law was written. And so, uh, you know, this is a very personal thing. And to me, you know, and I know Tommy is gone over and 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 fought for our, uh, this democracy and our rights and tried to, to bring democracy to other countries. And, and you know, he and my uncles all gave, you know, put their lives on the line. And we go out and trumpet democracy. But we find every way in this country to try to take these rights away from our own citizens. And I just don't think that's right. So big issues uh, that you're watching to be brought up. You guys have talked about a few that are near and dear to your hearts uh, in just the last few minutes, but, but what is another issue that you want to make sure is part of the convention platform, is on the lips of the speakers this week, maybe one that isn't on the radar quite so much? We'll start with you, Jamie. Well, uh, you know, uh, Congressman Ryan talked about hard choices uh, in, in his speech that, you know, America had to make some hard choices right now. And, and one of them, he, uh, he went on to talk about, uh, 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 he referenced generally, I guess, education. Well, you know, under his plan and under the, the, his congressional budget plan, he would basically turn back the clock on in terms of education in this country by repealing the, uh, tuition tax credits that President Obama uh, got passed through Congress um, by cutting back on Pell Grants and, and Pell Scholarships. You know, I was a poor kid that grew up in South Carolina. My mom was 15 years old or 16 years old when she had me. She uh, hadn't completed her high school degree at the time, so I was first-generation college. And I was able to go to college because of Pell Grants and, and subsidized uh, Stafford loans. Ended up going to Yale University, went back to my high school to teach uh, in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Gone and worked at a nonprofit that helps other low-income kids get into college. And and now you know, I'm a partner in, in a firm. And so you know, the federal government made an investment in me. Uh, and they make an investment in so many young women and men, black and white, Asian, what, Hispanic. And so you know, it's our obligation then to go back once that the investment is made is to go back and, and to be uh, participants and contributors in this society. And so if we looked at the budget, and uh, and the budget basically tells you the core values of a party, and you look at that budget, and, the, and basically the Ryan Republican budget cuts that investment. 
and long term, it just does not make sense. It does not make sense. And we need to continue to cultivate that. So I would love it if uh, President Obama and First Lady Obama and Vice President Biden take on that issue heads on because it's not only important to young people now, but it's just important to anybody who cares about the longevity and the prosperity of, of America. Tommy, let's go back to you and hear about an issue that you want to make sure is talked about this week, maybe one that isn't getting as much attention in the news. Well, first I'd like to clear up that, that yes, I am a veteran. I was never in combat. I was never in hostilities. Uh, could have. Uh, thank the Lord I wasn't. But I would also like to talk about education for a minute, too. I went to college under the real GI Bill, and they say that the real GI Bill was a fabulous investment for our government that the money that my generation uh, made and paid in, in income taxes more than offset the investment in the, the veterans that went to school on the, on the real GI Bill. Well, if it was a good investment for a veteran, it's a good investment for a non-veteran because it pays off. And I'm really worried about that. I, I have uh, two daughters that recently graduated student what that is crushing uh, when I went to school we had Pell grants and things like that when my daughters uh, applied for aid they didn't qualify for Pell grants and even if they had it was a drop in the bucket from what Pell grants used to do uh, re I'm really worried about public education and uh, I really think that the teachers unions need to be strengthened to make sure that uh, such a valuable job is, is recognized and for what it does with the nation's most precious resource, and that's our children. So I'm hoping to hear a lot about education over the next 30 days. I, I think I will. All right, Graham, before we let you guys go, give us one more detail about what it's like to be a delegate. Uh, Tommy, this is your first time. What surprised you, or, or what's been one of the most, uh, most interesting things that you've gotten to experience that the rest of us wouldn't know about? Actually, I, I think that we get herded around a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm used to covering uh, uh, state conventions and stuff like that, and you get to walk around and do whatever you want. But as a delegate, it's you have to be here. This is when you get fed. Uh, this is where you got to go. So it is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of stand in line and hurry up and wait, too. And I got tired of that when I was in the Army. I don't know if I want to be a delegate again. <laughs> All right, Jamie Harrison, how about you? Uh, give us one of the secrets of being a delegate. Well, uh, the, the great thing is that you get a chance to, to, to see and interact with uh, uh, the superstars within the Democratic Party. Um, it, and at all the receptions, the welcome receptions and the delegation uh, receptions and parties, you, know, you get... Uh, and the breakfast, uh, the delegation breakfast, you, you get, so far in South Carolina, we've had uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, Montana Governor Brian Schweitzer. Uh, uh, we get Martin O'Malley, the governor of Maryland, pretty soon, who will come by and visit us. And so that's really exciting to get a chance to see all those folks. And then apparently at our hotel, we, uh, we have uh, some media and so uh, a few of, uh, as I was walking in, a few of our, our folks were taking some pictures with some of the, the, the anchors from various news shows. And so, you know, all of that's really exciting, particularly when you have folks who, uh, you know, aren't in Washington, D.C. very often, and they're political junkies, and they just watch television, and as they say, you know, uh, D.C. is Hollywood for, for ugly people. And, and, but, but nonetheless... Uh, you know, you get a chance to, to a lot of the folks from all across the country get an, an opportunity to really rub elbows with, with a lot of these people. So uh, and that's really exciting to, to see the joy on the faces of people who, who don't get an opportunity to do this uh, every day. How about Hollywood for nerds, Jamie? Is that better? Uh, <laughs> well, thanks so much to both of you gentlemen, uh, Jamie Harrison from South Carolina, Tommy Johnson from Minnesota, two very different parts of the country, uh, two perspectives here in Charlotte at the Democratic Convention. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.